Okay, great. Welcome everyone to the Veterans Advisory Commission meeting on March 9th. It's 1.32, we're a couple minutes behind, but we will um, get through the administrative items pretty quickly. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen, so hopefully everyone can see uh, our material. And uh, Stephanie, is at full screen? Great, okay. So we'll get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Commissioner Anderson, if you could uh, do the honors, please. Will do. Uh, for the record, I am standing. Uh, hand over heart, or, or if uh, wearing cover, hand salute is appropriate. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and yes. justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and uh, for all those who are joining us, this is Commissioner Anderson's first meeting from SD5. So, uh, Commissioner, yeah, it's just a brief introduction. Do you want to let us uh, know a little bit about your background? Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, and I, I'm not on mute. Is that no? Accurate? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, good to go. Okay, good to go. Uh, yeah, uh, name is Dennis Anderson. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, uh, graduate of the uh, USC Veterans and Military uh, Families Program from the School of Social Work. Um, worked with uh, nice. Jim Zenner uh, on a number of uh, veterans initiative projects for mental health uh, up in my service provider area one, the Antelope Valley. Uh, my background in the Army was a, a Cold War paratrooper at the end of the Vietnam War era. Um, I did have the opportunity to go to Iraq uh, in 2003 and 2004 as uh, an embedded reporter, which uh, prompted my shift of career to clinical. And my son was a, uh, a combat Marine in, uh, in Fallujah. Great. Thanks, Commissioner. Appreciate it and look forward to having you and, and being a part of, of our discussions moving forward. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the Commissioner roll call. Um, Stephanie, if you can get started with that. Anthony Allman. Present. Joe Leal. Present. Present. Brittany Moore. Patricia Jackson Kelly. Joanna McFadden. Present. Present. Jennifer Campbell. Present. Marcel Rodarte. Here, sorry, I'm having problems over here. I'm here. John Gutierrez. Present. Dennis Anderson. Yeah. Present. And then just go through one last time. Brittany Moore. Patricia Jackson Kelly. Chair, you have a quorum. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to the next agenda item is approval of the minutes from last month. Um, I just wanna make sure that IT is working properly. Can people see the screen? Is that still working or no? Yeah, no, we're getting a thumbs up and a head nod. So, okay. Uh, well, uh, Commissioner no should- No presentation is showing. None, okay. That's not good. I'll go ahead and try to share one more time. How about now? We see it, Chair. Okay, great. Sorry, we're doing this meeting without IT staff support, so I'm shotgunning it. Um, so the commissioners should have uh, had an opportunity to review the February 9th minutes. 
Um, and then we'll need a motion and second, uh, and then we'll do a roll call to approve. So whenever uh, the commissioners are ready, feel free to provide edits or um, put forward a motion. This is Marcel. I'll make the motion if there's no amendments. OK. Commissioner, Commissioner Leal, second. This is Commissioner McFadden, I'll second. OK, I think we had Commissioner Leal jump in as, as well. So we're good on that. And we'll do a uh, another quick roll call and approve the minutes. Stephanie, if you could. Um, Anthony Allman. Present, or I'm sorry, approved. Joe Approved. Joanna McFadden. Approved. Jennifer Campbell. I approve. Marcel Rodarte. Aye. John Gutierrez. Aye. And Dennis Anderson. Aye. No objections. Great. Minutes are approved and we'll get on to the next agenda item. Uh, the chairman report, I'll make this super quick. Uh, everyone should have received a gov delivery notification for our notice of meeting on March 3rd at 5.21 p.m. If you haven't, that means that you're not subscribed to our mailing list. You can go to the Department of Military Veteran Affairs website. There's an option to stay connected. Um, the website is going to be updated. We're going to make it a little bit more uh, pronounced on where to subscribe. Uh, if you don't see it, feel free to reach out to uh, the commission uh, uh, website. I'm sorry, the email address or Stephanie, and, and we'll make sure to get you on there. Um, as far as commissioner action items, one of the things that I've been waiting on is the appointment of Commissioner Anderson to discuss our draft strategic plan. So hopefully between this meeting and the next meeting, you all can take a look at that again, and I'll put that on the agenda to uh, to make a final approval on that. We also, I received an email. Um, one of the things I didn't know, one of the great pleasures of being chair is I have to submit an annual report. Um, so between now and September, if there are any major items that you all think are important, feel free to send it my way so I can include it in our annual report. And uh, I know that the last time we met, there was an offer um, by the VPAN team to host uh, uh, commissioners at the different rally points. If you haven't done that already, feel free to reach out to VPAN and, and set that up. Uh, as I mentioned last month, we do now have a YouTube channel where you can find these commission meetings. Uh, if you search LA County Military and Veterans Affairs, be sure to subscribe. Currently, I think we have 16 subscribers. The goal is 100 so we can claim a unique domain name. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that there is a VA training opportunity on March uh, 23rd and 24th. This information went out through the county mailing list. If you didn't see it, here's a copy of the flyer. I'll leave it up there for a second. If you wanna scan the QR code, like the uh, Coinbase Super Bowl commercial, you can get the registration link and, uh, and choose to attend. Um, I forgot the TSAC, what, what that stands for. I think it's, uh, transitioning and service member veteran suicide prevention team, but uh, this is a VA sponsored event, I think in partnership with Columbia University. So um, something to consider if you have time on the 23rd or 24th. So I'll let that hang up there for another second and then we'll, uh, we'll move forward. Okay. Public comments. Um, this is an opportunity for the public joining us to discuss uh, any range of matters um, to let the commission or the department know uh, what's going on. The public comments are limited to three minutes. So I will go ahead and uh, start a timer and I'll jump in with about a minute left to let people know uh, just roughly that, that uh, their time is, is coming to an end. So our first speaker is Dr. Robinson. Are you there?
you may need to unmute the uh, general public line. Dr. Robinson. No, okay. Uh, the next speaker is Darren Hendon. Are you there? Darren Hendon from ST5. Okay. Nicholas Savalas, are you there? Also from ST5. Nicholas George Savalas. No? Okay. Millie uh, Ning, did I pronounce that correctly? Millie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll go ahead and start You're your time. Yes, thank yes, you for having me. Go ahead. Thank you. Would you like to provide a public comment? Sorry? We have you signed up for a public comment. Was there something that you wanted to uh, address the commission regarding, or were you just, did you mean to sign up to attend the meeting? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to join uh, the, the meeting for the veteran service um, to um, uh, give my uh, knowledge and experience on how to uh, treat pain condition uh effectively uh, well can be up to more than 50 percent uh reduction of pain in the first treatment uh by addressing the um, root cause of the pain so uh no need to uh take further painkillers and so that will be uh, able to help to uh the veterans to um uh, integrate to the society smoothly as soon as possible. Great. So I'd like to uh, join in the uh, sponsorship program. Okay. Well, this is public comment. We don't have a sponsorship program, but what uh, what district are you from? Do you know what part of LA County are you located in? Uh, I am in uh, Los Angeles, a city of Acadia. Arcadia? Okay. Uh -huh. I believe that's SD5, right? I, I think so. Okay. Well, do you have, do you have yeah. anything else to add? You have a, a minute left in public comment. Would you like to share anything else? Uh, that's it. It's the first time I joined, so I better um, listen more to, to see how I can um, help. Okay, great. Well, thank you yeah. for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, our next public speaker is uh, Roy De La Rosa from Nava. Are you there? Sorry, I think somebody needs to go on mute. We're getting a lot of uh, background. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe that is Mr. De La Rosa's line. Oh, okay. Roy, can you hear us? And he's muted now. Mr. De La Rosa, do you have a public comment? Uh, good morning. I'm sorry, a little late. Great. Thanks for joining us. Go ahead. You have uh, three minutes. Well, as uh, I'm a special guest today, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm just here purely as a guest today, representing the Native American Veterans Association. I am the spiritual advisor for NAVA, 
and Ted uh, Tenorio forwarded me this uh, this information to join and to see uh, how we can contribute. Great. Um, you have about two and a half more minutes left in, in public comment. Is Was there anything you want to add? I mean, I, I've seen NAVA at various organizations. Do you want to explain what your organization does? Yes, uh, I'm glad we're I'm here today uh, because the NAVA was founded about 20 years ago. I'm one of the founders of NAVA. It was founded in the Native American community in Los Angeles, sponsored by the United American Indian uh, community. and um, Back then, uh, we wanted to find a different way to communicate with uh, indigenous people, indigenous veterans, and apply a different way of gathering veterans to re reintroduce them uh, to civilian life. So what we did is we decided by visiting other fraternities like the American Legion and the uh, Veterans of Foreign War, that it was time for the uh, Native American community to stand up and, and uh, provide a different way of uniting veterans and uh, particularly introducing them back to civilian life and sharing our traditional values with with uh, these young veterans. So NAVA is an organization that is not just uh, founded by Native American veterans. We welcome all veterans, uh, men and women from all de all denominations, all ethnicities are all, all welcome to join our organization. And we've been very successful, I think, in uh, working with the community. We're recognized by the County of Los Angeles. Of course, we're recognized by the by the Veterans Administration, do a lot of work in CalVet. I personally am the spiritual advisor and the keeper of the Eagle Staff, and uh, I do a lot of visitation at um, the VA hospitals, bringing medicine to our veterans who uh, are, um, you know, they're bound uh, by, they're, because of their wounds, in the hospital and uh, back injuries and those that are paralyzed and so forth. Of course, during COVID, we've not been able to do that, but uh, we hope that one day the VA once again open itself and embrace us so that we can do this and deliver the medicine uh, the, in the uh, to to our uh, veteran community and our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is. Uh, Genevieve, are you with us? I'm sorry, uh, is that club, club, uh, my French is terrible, I'm sorry. Genevieve from SD5. Club rule, Gen Genevieve, club rule. One more time, Genevieve, are you with us? Okay. Uh, speaker number seven, Chi Zato from the VA, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, Chi, you got three minutes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Chi Zato. I work at the Department of Veteran Affairs, and uh, I'm just sending out a, a bulletin to all the commissioners. Um, I am one of the designated federal officers for the Veterans Community Oversight and Engagement Board. If you don't know what that is, we are redeveloping the campus at West Los Angeles, and there is a federal advisory committee that advises the secretary regarding the, impl the implementation of the master plan. And so these board members meet quarterly uh, and do research and give advice to the secretary. And we're going to be sending out an opening for membership. Uh, and diversity is really important to us. We want to make sure we have great voices from different generations of veterans, gender, diversity, identity. Uh, and so I really recommend uh, you please uh, reach out to me and reach out to the chair uh, because um, we really want to get make sure we represent all of Los Angeles very well. Um, I'll leave my email, but uh, um, Commissioner Allman also has my information. Uh, but please reach out if you have anyone or if you're interested, please um, talk to your constituents because I want to make sure that we have um, the most representative board that we can for the future of that campus. Um, I, and I'll leave my email in the uh, chat. Thank you, sir. Great. Thanks, Chief. 
Um, and, and full disclosure, I uh, also participate on the veterans, uh, the BCOEB or the Federal Advisory Committee for West LA. It's a great opportunity to be involved in the redevelopment process. If, uh, if you're all interested in doing it, I, I highly recommend it. It's a great opportunity to be a part, an active member of, of that project. So uh, with that said, uh, speaker number eight, Rudolph, are you with us? From JBS SoCal. Rudolph. Okay. I think at this point, this concludes public comment. Is there anyone on the speaker list that didn't have an opportunity to make a public comment? Hi, Chair Allman. Uh, this is Michelle Felix. Um, Keith Neeson and I um, represent Military and Veteran Affairs, uh, District 5 and 2, and we just wanted to give a brief um, uh, intro uh, to let you let you all know that we are in your area and we are um, we can help assist veterans in any way possible. Just wanted to get our names out there. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you. I, I think at this point uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item. So this month uh, is recognition of Women's History Month. I think uh, Commissioner McFadden will be introducing our next speaker. Awesome, can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you great. Okay, I know I had a little bit of feedback on my other screen, so thank you. So today I have the, the pleasure of introducing uh, Colonel Retired Dr. Gloria J. Willingham Ture, and if I mispronounced her name, she will let me know, <laughs> but I hope I did all, all right and did it justice. Um, and she's the Chief Executive Officer of the AFRAM Global Organization Incorporated, which is a nonprofit charitable organization based in Southern California. And she is also the founder of its Village Projects, which seeks to create environments in which persons from diverse circumstances and experiences can come together and co-learn in a way that bridges the opportunity gaps and um, retains the respective cultures and ultimately benefits society. And she really wanted to find a way that strengthens community support networks, especially social capital in health education and socioeconomic circumstances. So immediately prior to this role, she was an interim provost and senior VP at Field and Graduate University. Uh, she, her first nursing uh, first career was in nursing and she retired as chief nursing in education and, and is research officer at Long Beach Department of Veterans Affairs Healthcare Systems, which I'm sure you know how amazing that is to have. And she later became a member of the faculty at CSU Long Beach, where she, in addition to classroom and community-based teaching, led processes which resulted in increases in the integration of services and learning opportunities for undergraduate and graduate nursing students. So without further ado, I will allow uh, our wonderful guest speaker to present to us. So thank you so much for joining today. Thanks, Commissioner McFadden. Uh, Dr. Willingham? Yes. Are you there? Okay, great. Whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and 10 minutes. Oh, oh, thank you. I think we'll be 10 minutes on the nose, so okay. it will be very good with that. Thank you very much, though, for the invitation to speak, and particularly uh, to speak uh, during this uh, Women's History Month. Uh, it's sort of dear to my heart, so I really appreciate that. Uh, as you know, Women's History Month highlights the contributions of women to events in history and also in contemporary society. And every year, there's a different theme of the Women's History Month. And this year's theme is women providing healing, promoting hope. Women providing healing, promoting hope. And whoever would have imagined as this theme unfolded that we would be eyewitnesses to a war in which women are visibly recognized as citizen soldiers fighting for democracy, fighting in support of their country. While in reality, we've always done that in one way or another, but written history often too often shows us as anomalies as opposed to being essential elements of our military forces. Now, today's technology would change how our stories are presented to the world and to each other. Today's recognition of Women's History Month in this remote platform, this virtual platform, is just one example of that change. 
So looking briefly again at this year's theme and what it means for a purely uh, dictionary definition to start with. Uh, it talks about providing healing. Providing meaning the allocation of resources, whether it's money or goods, to allow a project to proceed to completion and on to the next stage. And we know that resources are needed to carry the history of women forward. That's been a missing element for a long time. And healing is the process of making or becoming sound or healthy again. So that this, 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 this gap that we have often talked about that's missing in our history, and that's the gap of women's history, that healing is a process of making or becoming sound or healthy again and promoting. Promoting means to further the progress of something, especially a cause. And in this case, we're talking about the cause of women's history to support or actively encourage people to carry that cause forward. So we're in the process of doing that as well. And hope. Hope meaning to want something to happen or to be true and to think that it could happen and it could be true. So this year, we are recognizing the processes and outcomes that led to this recognition of women in history. So let's start by looking backwards and forward. 1909, the first Women's History Day was celebrated. This occurred one year after 15,000 women marched through lower Manhattan in New York City in protest of the sweatshop conditions in which immigrant girls and women were working in the garment district there. One year later, the first Women's History Day was celebrated. There were many historical firsts occurring across the entire United States. And many of those other histories, however, are silenced by comparison because why the word didn't travel the way it travels today. So it was a smaller kind of recognition, smaller kind of celebration, but the seed of wanting women's stories to be heard, for women's experiences to be included in historical accounts was becoming evident. Imagine if we never heard this story but we never knew of this situation. And there are so many others. 1978, the seeds of hope had been planted. And on March 8th, 1978, concurrent with the International Women's Day, Women's History Week was launched in several parts of the United States. This was attention getting and seen now as important by an even larger group of people. 1987, the seed of hope was germinating now. Women and allies had lobbied Congress over the years now. There had been protests and protest movements. It was a time of change in the entire United States. It was the year that Women's History Month was established, 1987. I remember when that occurred, but I, like so many other women, did not really understand the depth of its importance. I was busy fighting the battle for racial equality and women's history was simply another layer. Moving forward, let us now look at the parallel histories of women in the military. I'm a veteran and so are many women in this audience today. Women with a long history of providing healing and promoting hope. The Army Nurse Corps was established in 1901. By World War II, more than 59,000 women were serving. The Continental Army started even before then you just don't have a whole lot written about that. Because in the Continental Army, they were requesting at that point for nurses to take care of wounded or sick soldiers. And that was as early as 1776. These women who heeded that call were usually the wives, sisters, or mothers of the men who served. We know about them. What we don't know about, though, are the women during that time who actually came in and went into combat because they had to disguise themselves as men. So we only know a few, about a few of them. And then as time went on, we had women in everything you could think of, physicians, medics, corpsmen, commanders, mm, and women in combat. Many of these women would die before acquiring the recognition as members of the military or as veterans. And yet we must recognize that they laid the groundwork for all of us. They were the promoters of our hope, the hope of all women. By 1941, 300. 50,000 women served in the U.S. military. 1948, President Truman signed the law making women a permanent part of military service. And today, over 300,000 women served in Afghanistan and or Iraq. Over 9,000 served in combat positions. Women now are over 16% of the U.S., the entire U.S. armed forces. I want to say thank you, women, 
who are serving during this COVID era. Thank you to all who served in the past and are now veterans. You, we have provided healing. We have promoted hope. In the words of Professor Kimberly Hamlin, when men make history, it's just called history. But when women make history, it's women's history. It is important that we all realize that women's history is not, the on, not only the history of women, it is the history of our world. Let us not forget. And our world is subjected to many omissions in history, often treating us as one group in which we all look the same, we all have the same opportunities, et cetera. We know that's not true. And so the intersectionality aspects of the history of women in the military is surfacing one story at a time. Very important stories that must not be left out of our historical archives. That includes the history now of cisgender women, transgender women, lesbians, the history of various racial and cultural groups of women in the military, the history of immigrant women in the military, the histories of women veterans will one day inform the mission of the Veterans Affairs on par with that of the histories of men. As that moves forward during this time of providing healing and promoting hope, thank you women veterans for your service. Thank you all members of the military for your service. May our collective histories inform the world of those who will form future generations. Thank you. I can't, I can't hear you, uh, Anthony. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, you're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, great. Okay, I was great. asking the commissioner had any sure. thoughts or any questions for, for you before yeah. we move to the next agenda. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, hearing none, thank you so much. We thank uh, Commissioner Jackson Kelly for bringing this topic uh, on the agenda and Commissioner McFadden for introducing. And for you, I, I should say Dr. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Gloria Willingham, right, Torre? Or is it Lieutenant Colonel then doctor? Now, uh, now I can't hear. Doctor, I think you're muted. This is the one. I'm sorry. I was going to say only Lieutenant Colonel Jackson Kelly always uses this litany of titles. Which right. I right. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. Joining us. Thank and, you. Uh, we hope you. Uh, Great. Great. Okay. Uh, I think I need to uh, share my slides again, or can everyone still see the slides? Hopefully. Okay. Great. So we'll get on to the next uh, agenda, agenda top or agenda item number eight, uh, VPAN briefing. Jim Zinner with us. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, give you the uh, VPAN update. Uh, next slide, please. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you okay. great. I'm in a big room and it's uh, going a little bit, so. Uh, just want to share a little bit real quick um, the uh, Department of Mental Health's overall strategic plan, which is incorporated with the rest of the county. Um, you know, we have three rings that we're looking at different domains. The red one is really uh, our our LA County residents that are in and out of um, the jail system, uh, in and off the streets and in our hospitals, and really do, um, generally use emergency services for access to care. The second ring is really that intensive treatment. So when uh, we do have somebody in crisis, getting them into an IMD or an IMD step down, uh, making sure that they have you know, structured you know, housing and treatment available to them. And the goal for, for every all this is really to keep them in the green, keep everybody in the green in the county, which is community services, living in their own home, thriving, having social connectedness, um, and it, you know, if needing mental health help, um, accessing it through outpatient care. Um, so really how this kind of fits in with VPAN, uh, which is very much aligned with all three of these rings is 
you know, we work with um, emergency services uh, to get uh, veterans that uh, have had a crisis to make sure that we're walking them um, through the crisis care if they need that back into green, um, getting them housed, uh, getting them uh, restabilized. Um, and if crisis care is needed, uh, navigating them into crisis care. But a main, main part of our strategy with VPAN is to keep veterans out of the red, out of the reentry initiatives, um, into their own homes, uh, and getting care through outpatient methods. Next slide, please. Combating isolation and loneliness. Um, right now, there's an active board motion around taking a look at this. Our department has prioritized veterans um, as the um, uh, population to focus on. So right now, every supervisory district veteran service team is uh, being asked to submit proposals around uh, collaborating with agencies that target um, loneliness and isolation. Um, so that as we're getting veterans in the, that red circle, we have programming that as we get them housed um, or get them back to their house and, and stabilized, that there's a way for them to stay connected. Um, this is a rather new initiative and um, really looking for the community um, to help inform uh, what the needs are in each of those, each of our supervisory districts. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just uh, from last month um, numbers. Uh, we had 766 calls to the line last month. Um, I think I briefed the commission. We had 964, so starting to uh, took a little bit of a dip in uh, February. Uh, and I think the, the biggest thing is really we've seen an increase for amount of referrals for veterans that are 65 and older, um, as well as uh, getting some uh, significant number of referrals for unhoused veterans and uh, military related family members. Next slide. Uh, this is the uh, number of unduplicated veterans and family members served uh, in each of the districts. Uh, the light blue represents DMH staff um, that have assisted the number of clients that DMH staff have assisted and the red uh, symbolizes uh, on the CBO end. Uh, in the future, we're hoping to um, make sure that we're getting data around how many clients are walking into each of our rally points in each of the supervi supervisorial districts, as well as um, our caps, which are community access points. So these are areas where uh, we place staff um, where there's high veteran traffic or high military family member traffic so that we're able to engage veterans and family members where they're going uh, to provide services. So hopefully in the future, we started collecting the data in January, we'll be able to start briefing that out, I think in another couple of months. Uh, next slide, please. So high risk veterans, so we have a uh, MO, our department has an MOU with uh, VA uh, at the vision level that covers Loma Linda, Long Beach and GLA. And we work with them to identify high risk veterans. Uh, primarily, if somebody is not VHA eligible, we take them on. And in certain cases where there's not uh, programming specific to veterans that are flagged at high risk for suicide, uh, we will we will take them on in partnership with the VA. So we have a staff embedded with the suicide prevention team at GLA um, who coordinates with the uh, VA team. And uh, part of that MOU allows us to share information when veterans are in crisis uh, to coordinate care. This is a breakdown by supervisorial district of how many um, high risk veterans were referred to the program. Typically, typically when uh, we get referrals for high risk veterans, um, they are kept on the DMH team just given our um, additional training in mental health and, and the fact that we have clinicians out in the field on our team. Um, so, you know, generally those those referrals don't go out to the CBOs just because uh, having having uh, having them in house in case if there is like a need to call out the uh, psychiatric uh, mobile response team or one of our co response teams at met or or the smart team. Um, we we have that working knowledge of how to work with uh, with uh, those police departments. Hey, Next hey please. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Uh, SD3, being a commissioner from SD3, February, there were 10 uh, high risk incidents. Um, any particular reason? I mean, it seems high, right, compared to a lot of the other um, districts. 
Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly why that is. I know there was a little bit more violence at uh, the CTRS site at the VA. Um, I'm not sure if that's associated with that, um, but I can get that information and and uh, and send send you the uh, information via email. OK, thank you. Do you want to go to the next slide? Sorry. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Here's the uh, demographic breakdown by ST. So I just want to let everybody know we, we can't do this every month. We're still working through being able to pull the data. Every quarter I'll be able to provide demographic breakdown by, by ST. Um, so the next month I'd be able to do this. As, we'd be able to do this as a team as June. But here's a look at um, kind of the gender breakdown. So we're engaging um, about 17% uh, women veterans compared to male counterparts. And we know in the county we have roughly about 9 or 10% of our veteran population are women. So um, that tells us that we're doing a good job. The teams are doing a really good job of, of reaching uh, women veterans. Obviously, we're not where we need to be. Uh, we continue to find ways to outreach and engage and bring women and men, uh, male uh, veterans into the safety net. But um, that was a little bit of uh, good news. Uh, and then you can kind of see the age breakdown there. Uh, a lot of older veterans um, are being served and in, in talking to the team, there's really just a lot of loneliness out there, um, especially with our aging veteran population. So a lot of the times the team are having um, a lot of the service provided is more conversation and um, and uh, peer support versus getting them linked to services where our younger veterans are more uh, needing to be connected to one of our VSOs with MVA or uh, needing to get enrolled in, in VA healthcare. Next slide. Uh, here's a continue, continuation of demographic breakdown by SD. Uh, there's a lot of uh, undisclosed and unknown. Uh, we're still working through data entry uh, issues as we move forward, but um, really with the use of Unite Us, um, it's, it's really about getting the workflows kind of uh, panned out. You, we sometimes get referrals from the community that um, where none of the information is is entered into the, um, the uh, member, uh, the, the uh, face page. So um, sometimes if it's a quick uh, referral or something like that, we're not able to capture that um, that information. So that's why you'll you'll see a high number in the uh, undisclosed and unknown. Next slide, please. Jim, we have about a minute left. Just a heads up. OK. Um, no surprise, Army is kind of in the lead um, as far as how many we're, we're reaching, but the Army is much bigger, as everybody knows. Um, really, this next, the military affiliation, um, this really is something that the team has talked a lot about. We're we're not uh, we're not reaching enough family members, so uh, we're continuing to part with LAVC to uh, do the family wellness days. Next slide, please. Here's the uh, total uh, total and permanent housing placement. Next slide. And the top three, I'll just end here. This is the top three needs per supervisorial district. Really with the price of gas, price of groceries, um, we've seen a lot more need for uh, temporary income um, support and uh, desire to be connected to benefits navigation. Um, so those are the really the big trends that we've seen across the board through all the supervisorial districts. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Uh, commissioners, any questions for VPAN or Jim? Uh, just this, I'm going to excuse myself, uh, uh, Commissioner Allman, and okay. the, uh, the other is uh, I always appreciate uh, Jim Zenner's presentations. They're data backed and evidence based, and I'm heading over to a uh, VPAN Met meeting after uh, I get my hearing aids installed. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Commissioner Anderson. Welcome to the commission and uh, good Thank luck with your appointment. Okay. Sir, this is. Mr. Joe Leal, uh, I want to thank uh, Jim Zenner for the update and the pretty thorough uh, presentation regarding VPAN and the amazing work uh, with his collaborators that it's doing. So thank you very much, Jim. I definitely appreciate the updates. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Commissioner. Anybody else? Okay, Jim. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You bet. At this point, I believe we're on the 
Uh, next agenda item, this is an opportunity for the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs to give an update. Uh, there is a new leader, uh, Stephanie, well, not new leader, uh, acting director previously was the deputy director. Is that correct, Stephanie? Am I unmuting? Muted, unmute, unmuting myself, yes, thank okay. you. Great. Um, and uh, so welcome, I guess technically this is the, the first advisory commission as the acting director and uh, we look forward to the presentation. Thank you so much. Let me just get my notes in front of me. So I apologize to everybody. Um, I, I believe I know. Um, let me just check, take one moment. I apologize. Um, I believe I know most of the individuals on the commission. Uh, but for those that don't know me, uh, again, name Stephanie Stone. I'm spent 20 years as a Navy sailor, as a hospital corpsman. Um, when I left, I joined Coral Southern California, went through a postgraduate program in public affairs, and then ran the program for another seven years, and uh, then moved over to the County of Los Angeles as the chief deputy, working alongside General Wong. And so I just want to take a moment to publicly thank her for her leadership throughout the years and uh, leaving us in a great position. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, under my current role, which is acting, uh, I see that my responsibilities are to ensure that our clients receive the best quality of service possible and to ensure that we also provide consistency in the leadership and the programs that we that that the general developed through her tenure. And um, uh, as well, the other part of the process for me will be to continue or to increase our communications, especially as it relates to our mission, vision and values. It's something we don't we haven't talked about very often and one that um, although we have talked about our mission, we could um, I'd like to engage with commissioners both on a one on one and as a team to really discuss um, what our mission, vision and values are uh, along with leadership team from the department. The mission, current mission is to connect veteran guardsmen, reservist veterans, their families and their survivors to the benefits and the resources they've already earned. And I just want to mention again, it's also recognizing our military guardsmen and reservists. I know the general had talked about this in the past, and I want to just continue to recognize that we have that responsibility to, to all of those that have worn the uniform. Um, in terms of our vision, uh, it is to be the one-stop military and veteran resource provider for the County of Los Angeles. We've been closed for the last two years, and it will take us a little time to really develop our um, our resources within the de within the building of Bob Hope Patriotic Hall. But I know working in partnership with other departments, such as Jim Zenner's Department of Mental Health and the nonprofits that we have, uh, U.S. Vets and JV. Uh, JVS and uh, Weedax and the other number of other nonprofits um, that we can we can surely meet that vision. Our values are to go the extra mile and to do what's right. Um, you heard from two of our veterans, who, veteran counselors who came online today, and honestly, those young men and women who are out in the community, um, that is what they live by. They. They spend every day and oftentimes over the weekends and the evenings uh, doing what's right and going the extra mile, reaching out to our veterans. So I just want to take a moment and thank them for their work. We're currently in a budget process. We have submitted our recommended budget and have heard back that we were approved for our, our six um, positions that we had requested. Uh, that includes five VCAs, those are the veteran counselors, um, and one admin support personnel or an ITC. Uh, those would be used in veteran services. Historically, we have been supporting the veteran services to increase our outreach to the community. It's something that we will continue to do if, if for as long as possible. And uh, at the same time, looking at the needs and the greater needs of the department, uh, which include um, admin and our building services. So, and com and communications, I just want to say that we have also, um, as it relates to budget, excuse me, I missed this, we have a mixed use housing project. So uh, I'm, if you've 
been to past meetings, the general has talked about our mixed use project, which was to place housing and parking um, with some small community shops uh, in the parking lot behind Patriotic Hall. We still have that listed on our budget as unmet needs, and we'll continue to promote and advocate for that housing along with our colleagues out of um, District 1. Under communications, we have a project also to improve our phone and website communication, and we're working with ISD, the county's ISD, to utilize Amazon communications. Um, it, we're looking at an increase of $35,000, and we'll put that in our final change or our final budget, um, and hopefully we'll see that uh, uh, come to fruition um, uh, later this year. Also under admin, you'll see inventory audit. This this slide, I should say, I'm just looking at it again. We we weren't able to transfer over all of the graphics, but this is uh, just a discussion around the admin division. So under uh, inventory audit, we had our first um, department wide inventory audit. It was an internal audit that was completed uh, just last month and under under um, admin audit. Uh, it is again the first time we're undergoing a departmental audit of the entire admin division, and that's being conducted by audit controller and will go on for a few months. Next slide, please. Excuse me. So this slide, break in. Okay, so this is building services. Just imagine that on to the left. Um, building services, and the first thing you see is break-in. We had a break-in on March 3rd at approximately 2 a.m. We've been fairly lucky at Patriotic Hall. We've had uh, a history of having um, vandalism, graffiti artists, and occasional window broken. Uh, but more recently, we've had individuals that have been jumping the fence, one just kind of scoping out the area, um, Maybe a few weeks ago, we had someone that actually got into the electrical boxes and flipped some of the transformer switches. Uh, and then on March 3rd, uh, they came in through the north, um, the north security doors uh, of the auditorium. That's where we have, for those of you that have been in the hall, that's where we have the elevator. Um, handicap elevator in the auditorium. So they just pop the locks on on the uh, on the um, door that goes security that door that goes through the alleyway and then the one going into the actual building. Um, it's taught us a lot. Uh, thankfully, uh, when they entered into the building, our current security system, which notifies the LAPD um, that any any action within the the building um, will will notify first of all LA Sheriff's Department who if they feel like it's a valid uh, concern will will send out LAPD and they did in this case so LAPD came and from what we saw on uh, the security cameras the following day the individuals seemed to have known that they were about to be um, visited because they left in a very short period of time, literally missing PD in, by moments. As one turned the corner, the the LAPD um, patrol car came through the alleyway the fall, a, a moment later. Um, and and the way they broke the lock was in, in such a way that it wasn't visible to LAPD and they didn't see any, any hazard. So we came into the office the next day and found gear adrift, but nothing was actually stolen. So that's the good news. Uh, the cost that we're looking at is approximately a thousand dollars to um, rekey the uh, those doors and any other at risk door. We're also looking at uh, an interactive camera system, something similar to our residential ring cameras. The current security system, although we have motion detectors that go to the sheriff's department, the camera systems. Um, are only visible for those that are in the building at that time. So we can not we can look at a recording after the fact, but we cannot see it while we're off site. If we, what we're looking for is something that can be viewed um, through our mobile devices that um, will also allow us to communicate to those while they're on, on, uh, on the facility. 
in addition to um, uh, in addition to the break-in and the cost related to the break-in, we've had water damage, and this has happened over the years. Um, we have the uh, glass bricks that are in the front on the Figaro side of the building, and those bricks leak quite a bit. Um, we've had damage over the years, and over two years ago, we went through some um, repairs and recognized that there was mold that had seeped down the, the um, not only through the ceiling, but down the wall and caused damage to the murals uh, of the Doolittle, in the Doolittle Room and the Doolittle Raid mural. Um, we are working currently working with ISD um, to give us estimates, which we expect to be well over $500,000. And then we will be applying for the CEO's extraordinary maintenance grant. So to cover those costs, um, that means that they will repair damages to the sidewalks, the glass bricks, as well as the interior walls. As far as the mural is concerned, we had already funded the mold remediation for um, for the mural. We had it taken down working with the arts and culture department. Um, they had uh, removed the mural. They have repaired and, and um, remediated any mold uh, to the mural itself. Now it's about uh, replacing or um, moving the, um, the mural over to the south wall of the Doolittle Room so that should they, we continue to have, I'm sorry, I think somebody else has opened up a mic. So if you would go on mute. So if, uh, um, so if we should, if we had re replaced it back on the same wall that we had had it in the past, if the, if the leaks continued, of course, we would have the mold return. And so we're, we're just gonna remove it over to the south end of that room. Reconstitution. Well, we've been talking about this for a while, so I'm excited to talk about the fact that um, we are uh, coming back into the hall, both tenants and um, tenants and public. We're inviting the tenants and the public back in next week on Tuesdays and Thursdays for a full day, uh, for full day, full hours, um, and uh, hoping to uh, open fully in May, April or May. Uh, as it stands right now with the numbers going down in the pandemic, uh, it looks it looks positive, but uh, the building is prepared with the exception of the offices in the basement now. Uh, we're all set with signage and custodial and security. Next slide. Special programs and communications. So uh, Kathleen Pache is our, our communications manager. She's been working alongside um, CIO's office and Greg Melinda's and his team to, um, to help us uh, develop our website. And with the help of Chairman Allman, we were looking at um, the design and uh, we should have an, we should have our website up. The approximate launch date is April 8th. Uh, we are still in need of commissioned pictures. I understand we have the bios on board. Um, so if you have not submitted your picture, uh, the other thing we might look at is in the next month or so, we may be able to take pictures to of, of the commission itself. But for right now, I'd love to have some um, some pictures of all of our commissioners to add to the website. Otherwise, we'll just we'll just leave those areas blanks those uh, that we're missing. The chair meant the chair mentioned gov delivery for the commission notification. We approximately ha we have an outreach of approximately twenty thousand um, emails right now, and people are opening the emails and clicking for more information, as we can see by public participation in the commission meeting. So I'm happy about that. Uh, we have a, a new campaign called Campaign for uh, New Faces of Freedom, uh, which started with the Veterans Day last year and will continue for this year. Um, the campaign is an outreach to transitioning veterans using multimedia, radio, TV, and social media. Uh, and and uh, we're awaiting confirmation of, of um, 
of funding for that for that project. As for information on the MVA website, um, that's a button that uh, the public can click for more information. We have three staff monitoring that that uh, that email site right now, um, and we're showing success already. So, as one one example is um, the example of the Afghan translator who reached out to us asking for services. As you may know. Um, we sit on the Afghan, the LA County's Afghan task force, refugee task force. It, it happened uh, at, with the closure of our Afghan base. Um, the County of Los Angeles created a task force really spearheaded by the veterans of this county. So I just want to recognize and thank the veterans that uh, got engaged with them. And it was largely because of their relationship with the Afghan translator. So it came full circle. We were able to connect the translator with the task force and the CBOs in the community that could provide him with the resources he was looking for. Another example of a, of a success story was a safety check. We received an email yesterday from a veteran, uh, a veteran's brother. The, the um, the vet himself was living in the parking lot of a moose lodge and had um, was feared to uh, be dangerous to himself. Uh, our communications manager reached out to James Zinner, who deployed a VPAN team, connected with him immediately, and Kathleen herself connected with the brother. So they came again, connecting um, the the veteran, the brother, and services uh, came together, and that's how. That's how this process is supposed to work. So we were able to see it in, in full fashion uh, in short order. So again, I just want to thank James and his team and Kathleen for doing the right thing. In terms of special programs, we also have the women's program in, in honor of Women's History Month. Uh, I just want to recognize we have uh, had a women's program in the County of Los Angeles Military and Veteran Affairs for several years now. More recently, we partnered with the Wolf Connection and ran a program, a resiliency program, um, in the Angeles National Forest, connecting wolves, the wolf pack with the women veterans. Um, it was a wonderful program, and they're looking at uh, having hosting a second program um, in the near future. It was supposed to start this month, and due to lack of interest, I, I say this because I'm I'm hoping for uh, the help of this community and the commission to reach out to the women veterans of your of your community to let them know that there are resources available. So um, we're hoping to run the program again in the next month or so. Women's History Month, we are uh, posting on social me uh, media, recognizing our MVA staff and our, our community, uh, uh, women in the community. Um, and, and then finally, I'll, I'll mention that there's a women's leadership conference that we are staffing with other county departments. This is scheduled for September 1st at the Bonaventure Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. And as that date draws near, we'll send out information for uh, ticketing. Um, I will say that in years past, it is uh, it sells out in a matter of a day. So if you're interested, whether you're male or female, it's a wonderful um, uh, opportunity for um, connecting to other departments, connecting to other organizations within the community, and um, some great speakers. Next slide. Veteran services. So this is veteran services, and what you'll see is just the numbers from last month. The number of veterans served last month alone for our 22 uh, veteran service officer or uh, service counselors was 40, 14,275. Out of those, the claims filed were, um, as I hate to just repeat what you see on the screen, but you can see claims filed. Um, informational conversations that happened both by phone and um, in person. Uh, phone calls were broken down under general claims and VPAN themselves. And at the bottom, you'll gonna, you'll note um, the actual rally point referrals. These are um, veterans that have been connected to our counselors um, for service. As you know, we have four navigators that work at the rally points. What you don't see on this slide, though, is that 
uh, along with those numbers, the 14,000 served, we brought in a total of $378,000 in retroactive pay and $23,000 in non-public assistance monthly. So we're hoping to provide you with more information specifically around the um, the uh, numbers of veterans that will continue to serve and increase that number, uh, as well as the dollars that we're bringing back into the county and putting it back into the pockets of our count, our uh, our county veterans. And I believe that's the last slide, Mr. Chair. Is there anything else that you have for me? Or any questions, Commissioners? Uh, if there's any questions for the acting director. Thank you. Um, I'll just add, I think you mentioned that there was a, a second Wolf Connection event that was maybe um, rescheduled or delayed due to, due to a lack of interest. Is that right? That's true. Um, I, I think that's a perfect opportunity to send something out through Gov Delivery. I'm not sure. Has that been distributed through, through the mailing it, list? It had been done in January when we were trying to reach out for the February class. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe what they're looking at right now is they have other contracts with other other departments and as well as other community uh, um, partners. And so we're looking for our next class opportunity. And as we as we identify that, we'll send that out through the commission as well as to Gov Delivery. But, you know, I think Gov Delivery can do a lot in terms of communicating and touching people out there. But I, I think we've all experienced the the value of having um, that one on one from another veteran that can tell sure. you that this program works. So that's why I asked for your help. Absolutely. And and just to clarify, the the Wolf I, Connect yeah. program is only for uh, female yeah, veterans. It is. It okay. is. Okay. Great. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Leal. This the is follow -up. Commissioner. Yeah. You know when, when I think of that. It's pretty amazing. I think the the connection, and thank you for sharing that, uh, Chief. Um, my first thought comes to women veteran on point, uh, specifically because they deal with primarily with the female veteran. But I would love some information to be able to push it through the reserve and guard channels as well. But thank Absolutely. you for sharing that. I was I was not aware of that program, but I would be more than happy to push that out, especially through the VPAN channels, because we Absolutely. do get a lot of female veterans that do come in to utilize the service and we have the access to be able to send that out. But uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, feedback on that. We'll do. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Any other commissioners? OK, great. Thank you, Director Stone. Appreciate it. And we'll move on to our next agenda item, item 10, which is items for next month's agenda. So as you can see, we're a little backed up on agenda items. Um, I've tried to cluster uh, the existing topics uh, based on, um, you know, sort of a, a, a shared, um, um, you know, topic. For example, you know, Boeing would like to present on their veterans portfolio. So that might be an opportunity to hear from Northrop as well regarding what they're doing for veterans. We heard at the last meeting there was a public comment regarding uh, uh, the Department of Children and Family Services. So that's in direct response to um, to a constituent. And then um, at the last meeting, uh, I believe it was um, uh, Larry Vasquez from the city of LA asked to, to provide um, a briefing to the commission um, and we also received a request from NPower Technology Training and TeleQ. So we we sort of have a path forward, um, but you know, of course, you know, this agenda is very much open uh, to discussion, and I'm sure there might be additional items that we want to add either to the April meeting or the May meeting uh, or June. So I'll, I'll leave it. It's an open forum, um, commissioners. If you if you want to jump in and and add anything or have any comments regarding the the path forward? Commissioner, I mean, Chair, uh, this is Commissioner Joliel. Um, in light of uh, the amazing presentation from Jim Zenner regarding VPAN, 
what I would like to add uh, within the VPAN, at least for for next month and moving forward, um, and this would be through the support of the program managers for VPAN, is the up upcoming wellness days, uh, events that are specifically designed for veterans and their families. And there's a lot of them happening within the SDs, and you may not know of, about them. For example, in SD1, in collaboration with Supervisor Solis, there's an upcoming golf a wellness day therapy that's going to be coming out. Uh, there are uh, upcoming one at Lay Lost Hardy Davidson, an upcoming one at Jacinda La Puente Adult School, and then there's an upcoming one in collaboration with Fairplex. So there's a lot of, at least for SD1 and all other SDs are doing the same thing, but it'd be really nice for everybody to know what's happening so that the commissioners can go out and support these events and get involved with them. So I'll see if that can kind of get submitted as well. At minimum, if that doesn't get submitted due to time, then to have those program managers at least email Stephanie so that she's able to put it out to the masses so that the community can go out. And the beauty of it is there's co collaborative partners right now that would be interested in being a part of these wellness days in collaboration with the LABC and different members uh, and supervisory districts. So I'll work on that. And uh, that's that's pretty much my, my alibi in the sense of contribution for agenda items. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. May, sure. I may I suggest that um, it oftentimes is used, the, that information is used in the good of the order. So as each commissioner ends the, uh, you end your meeting, you can give for the good of the order for the following um, projects or programs, events that are going on within your district. That might also be a good place for it. Okay. And I wouldn't say that it has to exclude sending that information out as as well though okay thanks director stone commissioner leal um we do have a recurring uh briefing from uh vpan every month maybe next month we can just get a quick forecast of events um and um and we, next month is going to be packed so maybe if we can do a little bit of an abridged vpan briefing um and then just focus on upcoming events so we can get to the other discussion items. It's one of the things that um, unfortunately the, the agenda for the back meetings, we don't have a lot of time. And so I think one thing I'm gonna need to work on is just a little bit um, of time management, maybe not giving speakers a full 10 minutes, maybe moving it to a five minute briefing, but that's something I'll, I'll run by uh, the commissioners uh, moving forward. Um, any other potential topics? Is everyone OK with with this plan moving forward? Um, I know we have good of the order next, but does anyone want to bring up additional agenda items? OK, hearing none, we'll go to the good of the order. So this is an opportunity for commissioners to speak freely, talk about events or concerns from the district. And uh, Commissioner Leal, do you want to start us off? Or uh, was yeah, your just adding? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, previously what I mentioned, um, maybe a slide um, in the upcoming VPAN presentation, yeah. but back to the upcoming events. And the last thing I want to tell you is uh, for SD1, very happy to have been involved heavily with the homeless count uh, that did pass. It was very nice to. Uh, do things with local elected and all the volunteers and to see all the passion behind it. Um, so quite a bit of that happened and to include all the community events that are taking place. Uh, but that's pretty much for me. If I think of anything, I'll advise, but that's my time. OK, thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Moore, are you there? Commissioner Moore. OK, uh, Commissioner Jackson Kelly, I, I'm not sure if you cleared customs yet. Were you able to join us? No, OK, Commissioner McFadden, anything to add? Nothing to add on my end, thank you. Great. OK, uh, I'll just add, as uh, Chief Zato mentioned from VA, the Federal Advisory Committee for West LA, I think is a great opportunity to get a little bit more involved in the redevelopment effort. 
not only does it have uh, an emphasis on the uh, West LA VA campus itself, but also services rendered to veterans throughout the entire catchment area, which as you know, is a little bit north of Long Beach all the way up to Santa Maria. So it's it's a huge opportunity, you know, vast services to veterans, and it's a way to participate in, in the process. So I would recommend if you're interested to follow up with Chi or Stephanie or myself, and we can uh, be sure to get you the uh, solicitation to become a new member. Uh, with that, I'm not sure if uh, Commissioner Campbell has anything to add. Nothing from me, thank you. Okay, thanks Commissioner. Commissioner Rodarte. Nothing for me today, thanks Chair. Great, Commissioner Gutierrez. Hi, yeah, so uh, for me, the only thing that I want to bring up is uh, I know Commissioner Anderson probably going to have a little bit more information about this, but the welcome home ceremony for veteran uh, Vietnam veterans uh, on Saturday, March 19th up in the Palmdale area. So I'm hoping that the, the, uh, Commissioner Anderson can give a little bit more information on that. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, Stephanie gets a copy of it so she can send it out to everybody. And uh, and then and again, uh, welcome to uh, Commissioner Anderson. Uh, it's great to finally have him on board. Uh, it, it, I know it took a while, but it, I'm glad you're here. Thanks, Commissioner. And I know Commissioner Anderson had to excuse himself for a VA appointment, so I believe that concludes the good of the order. And with that, uh, if there are no further, uh, uh, nothing further from the commissioners to add, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, adjourn the meeting. So uh, going once, going twice, with that, uh, that concludes our meeting. Thank you for attending, and uh, we'll be sure to keep everyone posted of the next meeting date uh, through Gov Delivery. So thanks again for your time. Appreciate it.